Welcome back to Second Breakfast and our ongoing coverage of A Game of Thrones, bringing you the best thoughts, theories, and literary analysis this side of the throne room. Oh, where Ned Stark has just entered. He's there to defend the last will and testament of his friend Robert Baratheon <laughs> and ensure that the right... Uh, oh. And he's in jail. And uh, he's imprisoned and all his friends are dead. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good. We're here to talk about Eddard chapter 14. So spoilers for everything show in the book. Maggie, let's start with the recap of the chapter. What happens in these Five tumultuous pages. Let me tell you. Can I also let y'all know we are recording with a new setup today. We finally have a new special fancy recording setup, um, which hopefully won't sound any different to y'all, but we're excited about it. So I just want to share it out loud. Um, okay. So this is uh, Game of Thrones at our number 14. Volume 50 of our Game of Thrones coverage. Oh, that's right. 50. Wow. So we've been almost doing this a full year. That's crazy okay yeah well welcome to volume 50 so it is the morning after ned and robert had their last little chat where robert dictated that whole thing and robert has made a miraculous recovery oh if only no he, he hasn't sadly <laughs> remember ned was like maybe the gods will spare him no mm -hmm. okay so they didn't ned is eating breakfast oh i'm sorry he's breaking his fast with Arya, sansa and septa mordain and Arya wants to like fit in one last lesson with sirio pharrell before they leave before they board the ship to go home to to, to Westeros? Nope, to Winterfell. <laughs> I did that last week. I said Winterfell instead of Westeros. That's okay. You can't have two Ws, man. It's it's confusing. Um, Sansa is angry that she can't say goodbye to Joffrey. We know why, of course, but y that wouldn't be a good idea. But Robert's, ugh, Robert, Ned is like, no, no, you can't do that. And so she's upset. And then about an hour later, Maester Pycelle comes in and Robert has officially died. R.I.P. <laughs> and so Ned says, okay, we're going to convene the small council immediately. So he gets everybody together, except where's Renly? Oh, he's gone. He's just fled, presumably to Storm's End, maybe? Question mark. So Ned's like, hmm, that's not good. Okay. And so he shares the decree that Robert had him draft the night before about how he's going to rule as regent until Joffrey comes of age. And he asks the council to confirm his, him as regent. Before they can officially do that, Fat Tom comes in with the king's steward. And the steward says that, quote, the king demands the immediate presence of the small council in the throne room. And Ned says, the king is dead, but okay, we'll come. And so they go in, and as Littlefinger promised, the city watch is stationed kind of all around the throne room, presumably on Ned and Littlefinger's side. But also there are a bunch of Lannister men behind the throne, and Joffrey is sitting on the throne, and Cersei is next to him. And Joffrey says that he wants to be crowned within a fortnight, he's ready to be king, etc., etc. And Ned asks Varys to read Robert letter and Cersei in one of the most hated moments of all time tears it into pieces and says we have a new king <laughs> and so Ned's like um well okay I guess I'm just going to reveal the truth here and he says that Joffrey's not in fact the true heir the true heir to the throne is Stannis Baratheon everybody's upset the younger children are confused Cersei then commands Barristan and Selmy to seize Ned because um, he's a traitor Barristan and Selmy kind of hesitates and he's like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and then the city watch turn and the Lannister men turn and everybody's attacking Ned and his men. And Ned's men are dying all around him. We're getting flashbacks to, to Jamie a few chapters ago. And Joffrey commands the King's Guard to kill Ned and everything's going bad. And then Littlefinger grabs Ned, holds a dagger to his throat and says, I did warn you not to trust me, you know. And that's where things end. Ned's big mistake here is trying to out diva Cersei Lannister. <laughs> Nobody could ever out diva Cersei Lannister. It's mm -hmm. just impossible. He does try, though. Good she had him. to defend her territory. It's true. She so did. yeah, this is Ned chapter 14. And we've been saying this for now uh, 14 chapters in a row that this is the one where Ned loses. We're like, wait, maybe this is it. This is it. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that more. I think we, we finally have some more kind of fodder for that discussion. But before we get there, I want to talk about the structure of this chapter, mm. because this did feel like a pivotal moment. I know we don't have many Ned chapters left, but I found the structure of this chapter sort of unique and mm. revealing. Oh, okay, cool. It kind of felt like a centerpiece. We've talked about this before with the, like the Harry Potter books where you people talk about the similarities between books one and seven, two and six, yeah. three and five, and then four is very much unique it's very and singular. on its own. Yes. And then you, you sort of echo through the onion layers mm -hmm. out of the rest of the series. Mm -hmm. I was noticing something like that within this single chapter Neat. where it kind of felt like a centerpiece and on either side of this singular moment, it's almost symmetrical. So mm -hmm. the chapter opens and ends with moments of staged violence. At the beginning, it's Ned looking out the window as the Lannisters kind of train in a way that's meant to intimidate yeah. him right out of his window. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. And at the end, there's, of course, the throne room the actual, coup yeah. where the Lannisters 
take their training into practice, <laughs> uh, also meant to intimidate him. And if you go one level deeper, so we're not at the beginning and the end, we're like one level closer, so a little further and a little behind, you have these twin small council meetings. Ned immediately tries to set up what is basically Robert's last small council meeting. And then, right at the end, before the throne room massacre, you have Joffrey's first small council oh, meeting. Oh, sure. Okay, that's nice. And then right there in the middle, as the centerpiece of this chapter, is the figure of Joffrey on the throne. Mm. And I think this is almost functionally a reintroduction of Joffrey as a character. He, he requests to be coronated within two weeks, within mm-hmm. this fortnight. But I think in an informal narrative sense, this chapter is his coronation. Mm-hmm. We yeah, see yeah. him, ex- you know, people follow his orders. He, he orders some deaths. He's <laughs> screaming on the throne, wearing all the fancy clothes. Right. He's king now, for better or much, much, much worse. <laughs> mm-hmm. And even that is kind of layered and echoed like everything else in the chapter where Ned has this flashback of Jamie being on the throne. So there is this kind of symmetry and duality baked through this chapter. But if we zoom out and look at the last couple weeks of analysis you and I have done, we had two chapters in a row. If you remember the last Ned chapter where Robert died the first time, and then the last (laughs) Danny chapter, we had two kings in a row dying. We had Robert and we had Viserys dying. And then we had a John chapter, and now we have this other Ned chapter. And these two chapters, the the John and this Ned one, they almost act as inductions. Like we're promoting select members of the next generation to make up for these kings who are checking out. I see. So Mm. in the last John chapter, we talked about him being almost knighted. There was this ritual of him joining the Brothers of the Night's Watch that felt like a knighthood. And on the other hand, it felt like sort of the consecration of him as the prince that was promised and Mm -hmm. the heir to this Targaryen destiny. So there's that elevation for John. And then in this chapter, you have a similar sort of elevation happening for Joffrey, where he has this new role of a king, but even the way he's introduced when you have all the heraldry of him entering the room and someone saying his name and all that, he's announced as the leader of two major houses. Yes. It's Lannister and Baratheon. And even his cloak is like divided in half. Half of it is lions, half of it is stags. And John's whole thing is getting the black coat and being the brother of the Night's Watch. So there is this level of finery and pomp and circumstance to both mm. of these elevations. And they both have an element of duality where John is embracing, I mean, he's sort of growing into this ultimate Stark and ultimate Targaryen destiny with the Night's Watch following his Uncle Benjen and the Prince It Was Promised thing following all of his Targaryen relatives. And Joffrey is becoming king following the, you know, paying off this Lannister and Baratheon destiny. So to, to turn this into a question, these two guys being elevated, taking these places of these two kings who have just died, are these our once and future kings? <laughs> what do you mean by that? John and Joffrey? Yeah. Because if we're just looking at the books, since we don't know how much of the show is apocrypha, right? The fifth book, which is the most recent one we have, ends with John dying. We know he will most probably <laughs> be resurrected in the next book. Yeah, it'd be weird right now, if they did that totally without any grounds. Yeah. Uh-huh. We just know that he's dead. Yeah. And that if we look at the arc of both of these guys, they're not going to serve in their kind of kingly roles. Ned, uh, sorry, John being in charge of the Night's Watch right. and Joffrey being king. They're both going to die fairly brutally while being betrayed in a place they thought was safe. John is yeah. killed by Brothers of the Night's Watch. Joffrey's. Joffrey's murdered and betrayed at his wedding. Yes. So these guys mm. are sort of more or less becoming the kings of this story. And they have weirdly similar arcs and endings. That's a really interesting comparison. I like that. And it's alarming. And I think it's an, I mean, I guess it's a point of contrast more than anything else showing like they're in these similar positions, but they go in wholly different directions. They're also both bastards, oddly enough, Ooh. which is really fun. Um, they're also uh, semi products of incest. John's not full incest, <laughs> but he's from a line full of incest and Joffrey is in fact There's full some incest. baked into the pie. Yeah, yeah right. So some, something squirrely going on in there. So I, I think that's, I think it, it heightens the contrast between the two of them so much more so. I mean, just the way we talked about like, um, you know, Ned versus John and Viserys versus John and Robert versus Viserys versus John. Like, that was all really interesting so i like this bringing it to the next generation and seeing how vastly differently they're going to approach their respective rulings i like that well and you know like they both kind of 
don't do things quite the right way. John breaks a lot of his a lot of rules. He breaks his own vows with Egret and stuff, and and doesn't abandon the Night's Watch, but gets kind of lost and has to infiltrate and do all this stuff. Joffrey is obviously always doing things wrong and terribly, and needs a lot of guidance from his mom to make things better. I don't so, believe they ever share a scene together, so it's no, interesting to kind of map them on these parallel tracks. That is really interesting. I like it a lot. I would like to keep sort of keeping yeah. an eye on that. I think that's pretty cool as it get this point of contrast because even in when you get to the clash of kings and you get to the war of the five kings you've got these other king figures who could also be compared to but joffrey's the only one who's actually king and like technically you know officially and john does officially get that kingly role as commander of the night's watch so versus like stannis who just calls himself king runley who calls himself king rob who is kind of king in the north for five minutes but not really you know so i i like that complexity there that's and john's larger destiny if we do tiptoe into the the realm of the show he does more or less inherit the throne of mance raider to become the king beyond the wall well exactly yeah that's that's pretty cool too Mm. i like that that's a fun there i i think so too i would never think to look at those two together and i think that's really delightful like that a lot let us know in the comments or on patreon (laughs) or in the email second breakfast at gmail.com what you think of that comparison just something to bookmark as we move forward since these characters are really as you know more than halfway through the book they're really starting to settle into their roles definitely what do you think of that Uh, and now I think we're going to spend the rest of the episode talking about Ned. I think so. But I think I think I have a good avenue into talking okay, about Ned sure. if that works. Because you talked, I'm thinking about this contrast thing between Joffrey and John, And there is a great amount of conflict and tension and contrast in this chapter too. And I think I want to talk about that as our avenue into talking about Ned and his problems. Look at you with a segue. His problems. I'm very good at segues. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I have to do them a lot in my job. And that's just like, anyway, it's part of it. I'm an educator. Okay, so um, I'm going to do this through colors. Um, and so you would love to talk about colors. You like to talk about what the colors mean, the symbolism, all that. And so I sort of... Tristan and I will be talking about color next week in a discussion of normal people. Oh, that's right. I'm so excited to hear that discussion. I wasn't on that episode. Um, I watched the show and I loved it, but I didn't feel like I had a whole lot to it say about it. It was a fabulous time. It is an I'm hour really excited. of Let's rip-roaring analysis. I think it's going to be cool. It's. I think this is. that's the only episode of ours that I've... I still haven't heard like even other episodes that you've recorded yeah. on your own. I always like listen to before we drop it. I just like haven't listened to this. Get it'll be, be a little treat for me. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so there's a lot of gray. There's like a contrast here between gray and white and red and gold, gray and white being the Stark colors, red and gold being the Lannister colors. And I want to kind of break down the different instances of those and then maybe start to g- complexify and complicate those as we go. So, you know, at the very beginning of the chapter, we have a sentence that says, the gray light of dawn was streaming. We learn that the morning was overcast and grim. We see that there are gray cloaks. Um, uh, what does that say, Maggie? Snapped? Oh, they snapped in the <laughs> wind as the guardsmen marched them across the yard. So there's a lot of like coldness, grayness going on. Obviously, there's gray around around Ned. And then on the other side, with red and gold, we see that there are men in mail and leather and crimson cloaks making their morning, making the morning ring. Um, we learn that there was no no Lannister crimson to be seen outside. There's a lot of stuff about crimson cloaks, but even Cersei is wearing a golden ring. Joffrey is wearing cloth of gold, a cloth of gold doublet and a red satin cape. Um, and the Lannister... Cape? Yeah, the, I know. Another diva. A little cape. And the Lannister guards <laughs> are wearing crimson cloaks. Yeah, makes sense. But then it starts to get more complicated because we see that um, the Kingsguard, who presumably should be... Oh, no, sorry, the, the, the Kingsguard, who are on the side of the Lannisters, they're the ones protecting King Joffrey, they're wearing long pale cloaks over their shoulders with shining white shields strapped to their left arms. So they've got like pale and white colors, so like gold and white on this like Lannister side of things, even though those are the Stark colors. And on the same side, we've got like gold cloaked um, ranks of the City Watch. The City Watch are supposed to be on Ned's side, but they're wearing gold. So there's a little complexity in like which color represents which side. And there are a lot more instances of like people wearing, you know, on the Lannister side wearing red and gold and et cetera, et cetera. But here's my favorite thing is that Cersei, she's wearing a gold ring but she's also described as wearing green. She's wearing a green dress. She's got a big emerald on her ring and on her tiara. Green is the opposite of red. Mm -hmm. And so on the, like on the color wheel. So I thought that was interesting. And so not only is there a nice tension between this like golden red and gray and white thing, especially we see that the gray and white and the red and gold are influencing and permeating throughout the morning and the day. And like they're, they're kind of on equal footing the whole way through. But it said it's not as simple as 
red gold equals bad, white gray equals good. It's actually a lot more complicated than, than that. And I think that's sort of our running thesis about Ned is that the world is more complicated than he makes it out to be. On the outside, Westeros has this very like it looks like a very simple, like simply divided realm. All the different houses have their own colors. It's very clear who's loyal to who and who sort of has the right mind about things and who doesn't, who betrayed who in the past, who needs to be checked, et cetera, et cetera. There's an org chart. Right. <laughs> but it. the more we read this story, the more we discover that, oh, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. Than that, Because even like the hound is described as wearing like soot gray armor, even though he's so obviously and has always been on the side of the Lannisters. But of course, we got that moment with him and Sansa when he showed himself to be still scary and not very cool, but also has an ounce of humanity to him and we understand him more as a human being and that's really interesting. So it feels like Ned is just not aware of the complexity of how all of this works. And he's like, he incorrectly assumes that the city watch are on his side, but they're the ones wearing gold cloaks and he should have understood, like he, sh he should have known better not to trust Littlefinger as Littlefinger tells him. And it's actually not as clean cut as he would like it to be. Cause even still at the very end of the chapter, Littlefinger threatens Ned with his own knife. Littlefinger pulls Ned's dagger out of his like belt and holds it to Ned's, to Ned's throat. So he's like betrayed by his own dagger, literally. And so he's just sort of not naive to the complexity of the world, but he just can't- Continually surprised. He can't keep up. And that's so frustrating to see. I like that Cersei isn't wearing the traditional Lannister colors because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but last time she and Ned had that conversation, she was wearing almost like these hunting-, hunting greens. Yes, exactly. She just has green eyes. And I like the continuity of her staying green mm, because, mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's the opposite of red, but it also differentiates her because I think he keeps ask he keeps expecting her to react like- he thinks the Lannisters would, or right. she might actually flee with her kids. He says but, to himself at the beginning of the chapter, why hasn't she fled yet? What's going on? But that little inkling of suspicion of, why is this person not acting in a way that I expect them to? That mm. that gives her some sort of X factor. So having her visually stand out from everyone else on her side is interesting. In the same way, Littlefinger shows up wearing blue mm -hmm. and gray. Mm -hmm. So there's a, he's kind of on Ned's side, but there's also <laughs> this other kind of wild card color that is an X factor that Ned should be more suspicious of mm -hmm. in the same way we describe Varys. I think he's wearing pink or purple. He's or wearing, something. he's wearing pale pink and purple. Yeah. And he's described as he, he just washed and he's kind of rosy mm -hmm. and overheated. I, I related strongly to the description <laughs> of him uh, being over. I used to call myself a boiled ham, Aww. but that was before I grew the beard. Different conversation. <laughs> now you're I a ham with a beard. Yes, what exactly. <laughs> I like that level of, color analysis i think that yeah. totally makes sense here because it kind of maps the major players almost like you're playing a game of risk there's a color coding but ned isn't picking up on it right and it's not as simple as you want it to be because you could you could try really hard to read this as oh well the hound is wearing gray so maybe that means he's, he's a gonna... secret star yeah and you're like no, <laughs> no it's not that no. simple like it's just not it's right. never going to be that simple and that feels sort of like george being like tee -hee. like it's sort of a mm -hmm. nudge and a nod and a wink like it's actually these are not clues they're it, provocations exactly and so then when you've got Ned telling himself while he's in this small council, he says he thinks to himself that he has to play the game until he's firmly established as regent. You're just you just want to scream at him because you're like, you are not playing the right game right now. Everybody around you is playing a different game and you just can't see it. And we've been saying that for this whole book. And that's so painful to watch <laughs> yeah yeah so let's let's talk about ned some more because yeah. I, I have like three questions here i want to play with and they're all discussion topics more than points because i did I, I think we both enjoyed the process of reading this and had more to kind of work through than we had theories to present so the first one i want to play with once and for all 14 chapters in we've had this conversation or a variation of it 14 times <laughs> is this the chapter where ned loses <laughs> You know, the more I ask that question, the more I think he lost in chapter one. <laughs> That's fair. Like, I think him going to Winter to, to King's <laughs> Landing with Robert, him agreeing, yeah. him, again, this whole thing he has about himself of like, I have no choice, I have to do it. Catelyn saw from the beginning that he had a choice and he chose to go and he shouldn't have. Like, I think that's where he loses is when he decides, like, after hearing about the the thing from Liza and learning that the Lannisters probably killed Jon Arryn, Ned felt like he had no choice but to go. 
And I really don't think that's true. And I think he should have stayed behind. I think that's where he lost was from the very beginning. Because I feel like we're, we have so many characters. We have so many POVs that if you just look at Ned's story, we are approaching the climax and then the yeah. falling action and then the beheading. But you know what I mean? <laughs> like we're getting to the climax. Even if you look at where your bookmark is in the novel, we're getting to the juicy part yeah. of the story. Yeah, we're definitely over halfway through now. Even the way Game of Thrones seasons were always arranged, the big episode was season nine. Episode Right, episode nine, nine mm-hmm. not episode 10. So we're right. getting to that meaty, consequential section. And I was trying to think about this in terms of general storytelling structure, not just within fantasy. And I was, th- I found myself thinking about sports films, hmm. where in basically any sports movie I've seen, we've all seen a hundred of them. You can't grow up in the world, especially America, mm-hmm. without seeing a bunch of these. The climax of the movie is always the most fun. And I'm thinking about Rocky or boxing movies or anything where it's about like a central conflict that is decided in a one-off event or Mm. game where the main character is on the ropes and you have to see them almost lose and they're at their absolute lowest point before they rally to win and you get the theme Mm -hmm. song and then the lights go up and the popcorn. Like, are we at that moment? Is... Is George almost teasing that we could be at that moment? Or is Ned just screwed? Like, I feel like this is, <laughs> I feel like he keeps uh, kind of like the matador waving the flag. I feel like George is toying with this, this idea. I think he's teasing us with, well, everything in its darkest before the dawn. Right. How's Ned going to wriggle out of this one? <laughs> and I think this is the basic twist. Like Grimdark, we talk about, we've talked about a lot in the last month or so, mm-hmm. as this big complicated subgenre of fantasy. I don't think it's all that complicated at all. I think it's just the unsatisfaction of denying the hero's journey. Well, yeah. And we're, there's such a thing in fantasy. I think the fantasy of fantasy is that the heroes win. Yes. Yes, for sure. It's that you defeat Sauron. It's that you defeat, you know, any any Voldemort. Any fantasy series mm-hmm. you pick up, especially in the last hundred years, roughly, the fantasy is that the good guys win. Mm-hmm. And you have a bunch of pretty fantasy imagery along the way. Mm-hmm. And by breaking that, like th- there's almost this threat of grim dark over this story as it unrolls, yeah. and I think it kind of pinballs our conception of fantasy, which is just victory at the end. I think you're right because I think as a first time reader, like you know, in the '90s when the show hasn't come out, you have like the, this is a kind of it's a much newer, more groundbreaking thing. You read this and you go, okay, this world is really dark and twisted and scary, but, but. like <laughs> Ned is our hero. Yeah, yeah, this is his climax. This is where like I think things are going to get a little worse from him from here, but I'm really excited to learn how he's going to get out of it, how he's going to overcome it. Is he going to escape? Is you know, is Cersei going to be beheaded? Like what's going to happen? And you really do think that he's going to come out on top. At this point, you're probably clued into okay, it's going to be really difficult and maybe somebody's going to die in the in the process. Maybe Catelyn will die. Maybe Tyrion will die. Maybe, you know, Arya will get captured. I don't know. But like Ned's going to come out on top. Like I can't wait to see how this unfolds. And so then when he doesn't win, it is such an oh shit moment. And I remember it being like that in the show too. I really do. I remember thinking this story is so interesting and dark and twisty, like I just said, but like it was shocking when Ned died. Like There's I, a safety net I mean, at all of these losses along the way. All of right. these previous 13 chapters, he's kind of lost, but there's a little glimmer of hope. There's always something, yes. And, and even like up to the moment when the sword swings, you think something's going to happen. You think someone's going to swoop in and you know, Arya's in the crowd. Maybe she's going to do something. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And then nope, it just happens. And it's like, it's it's so it feels so groundbreaking right. but it's it's so protracted this teasing and then ultimate rejection of this fantasy mm. of the heroes winning of this victory that almost feels guaranteed anytime you begin a fantasy story so let's kind of test that hypothetical okay if this is the chapter where ned loses why does he lose and i was trying to write <laughs> i was trying to bullet point some of these and you'll see i kind of uh I fell into a pattern rather quickly. The first one was, well, he shouldn't have trusted Cersei and told her his plan. And then the next bullet point was, (laughs) well, he shouldn't have trusted Littlefinger and told him his plan. He shouldn't have trusted Renly. He shouldn't have trusted Varys. He shouldn't have... He shouldn't have trusted anybody. If we zoom out, which I think we've been doing a better job of lately, and sort of just ask, so what? What is the point of this repetition? Is it Mm. that Ned has this individual character flaw or makes this error multiple times Or is there a larger message or moral here? Because Mm. I think there's an underlying thing 
in all discussions about Grimdark that it is making some societal commentary mm. that well the good guys never win and that's that's what real life is mm-hmm. like and it's what's this, the point yeah mm-hmm. but that that's sort of the point is uh, that it's making some point about real life and mm-hmm. that it is unfair and that there isn't this underlying narrativity and guarantee of victory if you are virtuous enough do you think we're making that point or are we just heightening this one individual character flaw of Eddard Stark. No, I think it is larger because one thing that I was really clinging to and have been clinging to these past few Ned chapters is him insisting he has no choice. He does that here three different times. He says that he didn't like the fact that Renly was gone, but there was nothing to be done for it. He says to Cersei, you've left me no choice but to tell the truth about Joffrey. And then he says to Cersei again, you leave me no choice, commander, take the queen and her children into custody. Like he over and over insists that he has no choice, which I think you can zoom out into this narrativity idea you're talking about is that he, not that he ever, Ned doesn't take things lying down. He doesn't just like flop around passively and let things happen to him. He's an active participant in his life, but he sees things in such an interesting way of like, well, some things have to be this way. I have to go to King's Landing because I have an honor, you know, I have this like, I'm honor bound to um, to John Aaron to seek justice for his death. I have to do X, Y, and Z. And I think you can extend that to the narrativity idea of like, not that Ned actually thinks of things as I am the main character and I will win. But like, when we're reading a traditional fantasy story, we assume that characters are destined to do X, Y, and Z on whatever level that story really believes in or, you know, talks about destiny. But so Ned thinking he doesn't have a choice, I think speaks to Ned is destined to win. He's destined to do the right thing. He's destined to, you know, do the thing that is honor bound and duty bound. And so I think the fact that he doesn't take a more active role doesn't really stop to consider what you know, might make the more most sense to do or what would be the smarter thing to do or what he could, you know, really try to take action on, even if it's not the right thing to do. I think that's kind of where it, that, that flaw is. Do you know what I mean? But does this mean that there is some underlying moral that we're meant to glean from this? Is this just a story that happens to go in all these unexpected and unfortunate ways? Or is the moral that you shouldn't trust people and tell them your plan? <laughs> is the moral about Ned not seeing all these all this stuff right in front of him? Are we getting at a moral or are we just telling a story? I mean, Because I think... the longer we tease this mm-hmm. thing, this mm-hmm. rejection of the hero's journey, the more it feels like we're trying to make this point more emphatically. Like the last question that I was thinking about is, why doesn't Ned just die here? Like, wouldn't that be a more brutal or sudden reversal of fortune? It might even do more to hype up Littlefinger and Cersei as our villains if you did kill Ned here, because he does ultimately die, so you kind of hit the same plot beats. Mm. And the I was trying to think, like, what is gained by the delay to imprison him and then later execute him? And the only answer that popped up to me, tell me if you have another one, is that George is continuing to tease this expectation we have from things like sports movies that ultimately the hero will rally and the longer you tease that the more you stoke those flames and expectations in the audience only to again ultimately reject it as your thesis mission statement of the book it feels like he is making that point more and more emphatically so even if i am incredibly resistant to seeing underlying morals or messages inherently in a story it feels like we are really, really trying to make that point here. I think so. I think you're right. And I think it's, it, if there is a moral here, it's that you have to, it's putting in effort. It's you have to be an active participant in and, you know, driver of your own life because otherwise everybody around you is going to do it for you in maybe not the way that you want it to. I, I don't think the message is, well, you should also be a sneaky, conniving, lying, you know, piece of shit in order to survive in this brutal world. I don't think that's it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have characters like John, you know, and, and, and even Danny in a way. So I don't think that's the point. I think it's more like I can't remember what happens to Ned in prison. I can't remember what he does or doesn't do. I think at some point they say, hey, you can go take the black, but he refuses. Like, I think he remains stubborn in his point about Joffrey and Cersei's kids are not Robert's. They're not, you know, they're not the rightful heirs to the throne. Stannis is. I think he, he sticks by that until the end of his life. Right. And which is like good to stick by your morals. But I think the point is there could have been a way to get through that in a way that helped you survive and Mm -hmm. kept your kids safe. And I think that's sort of the fault there is that he thinks that, well, 
I don't have a choice but to refuse X, Y, and Z because it's not the right thing because Stannis is the rightful heir and I won't back down on that. I think that's what it is, is just being active and not letting other people make choices for you. Because his continued kind of principled obstinance is the thing that ultimately kills him and always Mm -hmm. has him on the back foot. And that's what led him to go to King's Landing in the first place. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to figure out, and again, let us know in the comments or yeah, email. Yeah. Or, and what do you think, what is gained narratively or in some sort of message or moral, what is accomplished by delaying Ned's death when it so easily could have been the end of this chapter? Right. I mean, there's also, if you zoom in, it's like the practicality of it. The Lannisters don't kill him at first because they can use him as a bargaining chip to get Tyrion back because remember, Catelyn still has Tyrion. But this whole throne room full of people heard the new King Joffrey scream for them to kill Ned. Yeah. Who would have raised an objection to that? No, that's that's true. Yeah. I, but like it, it, it's it's beneficial for the Lannisters because they can hold on to him and, and use him in ways. But you you know, you're right. Like it, George could have written around that. So he chose to extend his yeah. his like, imprisonment and, you know, death. So that makes let's sense. Let's game this out for a second. How would the story have been different if they did kill Ned in this moment? Because <laughs> Renly has already kind of run with his tail between his legs. He's doing even, his own thing. Yeah. Even if he's going to tell Stannis about all this, what are the odds that Renly and Stannis are going to get along for long enough to, I don't know, march on King's Landing? Right. I mean, we know they won't because we've read Clash of Kings. <laughs> no, but so. we're changing the rules here. I so see. if they had killed Ned in this moment, then butterfly effect, anything can change. Mm. Do you think there's a shot that those two would have led a rebellion against this kind of Lannister Baratheon? Oh, coup? I see. Then, yeah, they might have. They might have tried to join forces with Catelyn. Would Renly you know? do that so that Stannis could sit on the throne? Oh, I think he would do it and pretend it was so Stannis could sit on the throne and then he would undermine him and betray him somehow. Yeah, I, think I don't know. Because I think <laughs> the, the, the interactions we've had with Renly up until this chapter, he has seemed very Ned-like, very principled, where I don't know if he would undermine his brother. I think he would, hmm. he would respect, maybe interpersonally resent, but ultimately respect the rules of the succession. Sure, yeah, because I can't remember why he chooses to make his own claim other than he thinks he'd be better at it than Stannis. I, I, I can't remember, so, so if you're right. That's the only evidence we have is that he's pretty, I mean, except for this demonstration of him running away, he's pretty honor-bound and, I don't know, good-natured. Yeah, so <laughs> if the Vale and Winterfell have both kind of lost their figureheads and Storm's End is kind of scrabbling yeah. and powerless and even the Gold Cloaks aren't working with them, the Lannisters have kind of all the chips on the board. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, the one thing they don't have is that is Tyrion because Catelyn has Tyrion. They also could have, you know, there's that whole rule of like, you you don't leave the heirs alive to then grow up and avenge their, mm-hmm. like Arya and Sansa. Right, right. I wonder if they had killed Ned here, what they would have done with Sansa and Arya. Right. Well, especially because Arya wouldn't have escaped. Because to someone like Cersei, they are loose ends that are within their control. Mm-hmm. I think the, yeah, they would have yeah definitely used them because they already Sansa later, would not have married Joffrey. No, no, no. They they would use them as a way to to win the Starks over and to like to to quell hostages. any re- rebellion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The way that they use Sansa later, they probably would have used them as hostages to get Tyrion back because they don't yes. know about Catelyn and Tyrion kind of splitting off yet. Oh yeah, I forgot they split off. But yeah, because they they know that Catelyn wouldn't kill Tyrion if they've got the girls. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, it, so, it would have. It, it could have totally still like worked out in terms of like politically, you mm-hmm. know, geopolitically. It's more about like narratively. What? Ha- why is this happening? But they've so got the iron sense. fist politically. Mm-hmm. Like, I understand the narrative angle, and we're leaving aside any number of moral frameworks. But <laughs> if you're a Lannister who doesn't care about the rules and is just trying to win, I think the move would have been to take out Ned in this chapter. Mm. I think you martyr him by giving him the pomp and cer- circumstance and performance. Of the execution. I think you're right, too, because I think their goal in the public execution is to make a statement about this is how we handle traitors. But you're right. It just turns them into this martyr. And it sure. makes the I think that's what allows Rob to become king of the north. Like yes. that's what like incentivizes and aggravates the north and makes them despise the, the Lannisters. Versus more. just saying, well, your dad went south and then, you know, it's all on record. He said all these treasonous things about the prince. Yeah, and like the that king. was fucking weird. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. what happened to your dad? And now yeah. it's. Your dad was executed by the evil king. Yeah. And so, of course, you have While this... his daughters watched and screamed. Right. So yeah. Exa- well, you're... Yes, mm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 It's, it's very different. So, so it's kind of a, kind of backfires for the right. Lannisters a little so bit. So as much as we started this conversation by saying, does Ned lose here? The way I'm ending up after talking through with you is almost that the Lannisters are having a worse chapter, mm. despite winning in the moment. <laughs> 
long term, I think they make a huge error here. Yeah, I think I think you might be right. That's mm. interesting. I'd love to hear other thoughts about yes, that down please. below. But I think yeah, they, they it might have been better for them if they just killed Ned immediately and grabbed Arya and Sansa immediately. Like I think that would have been much more beneficial for them. Mm. But yeah, they yeah, also could have. I mean, not to just hypothesize on how to kill Ned Stark, but <laughs> you could have like once his leg was uh, screwed up in the previous coup attempt, mm-hmm. you could have just like poisoned him. Well, right. And but they, said, oh, his leg festered, and he, well, we don't know what germs are. So he died. He got the fever. That's true. It, the problem is Joffrey. That's the problem, is that Joffrey's the one who said, kill him. Joffrey's the one who, like, wants to make a public display of how we deal with traitors. Like, Cersei, I don't think, I mean, because we know Cersei killed John Aaron, and she did it through poison to make it look like an accident. She doesn't like to publicly you know, declare her power unless she's doing it really, really strategically. So I think that's probably what she would have preferred, but the problem is Joffrey's the king. To pull it back to something from Fire and Blood and House of the Dragon, when you have those two, the Eric and Arik, those Cargill brothers Mm -hmm. who kind of die together fighting on the opposite sides of the war, if you look at how useless and kind of complicit the singers are in just consecrating propaganda and Mm -hmm. turning it into this like cultural memory, if you had, say, say Cersei gets the raven that Robert's finally dead. If she sends someone like Littlefinger to go kill Ned, and then mm. you tell the singers, well, he just he he couldn't bear the news of Robert's death, and they died mm. within minutes of each other. Like, <laughs> there are uh, we talk about Cersei being this great strategist and up there with these spy masters, and she mm. does survive for a long time. Yeah. But I think we're going to find as she takes the spotlight more that she misses a lot of opportunities. Yeah, because she gets too vengeful. That's her problem. She gets too sure. personally involved mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way that others don't Yeah, because even that diva thing that we complimented before of her ripping up the letter. Yeah. That, I mean, we just saw the exorcist again. That is too vulgar a display of power. <laughs> It's perfect. You know, there's yeah. a way that Tywin would never show his hand like that. No, he would never do that. Yeah. There's an open antagonism there that is not smart. Can I just say, mm. as an off, off as a side note, I love that we still have not seen Tywin on the page. Tywin is the big bad, and we still haven't met him in this book yet. Which kind of elevates him to Sauron level, right? Right. I think it's so interesting that I don't think we meet him until Clash of Kings. And I think that's wild. <laughs> and I find that really fascinating and exciting. And mm-hmm. I think that's one of like, his George is more daring but smarter moves. I just think it's restraint. Cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Anyway, so but like, but that's cool about this chapter too is like the threat of Tywin hangs over everything because you see Jane, Cersei as this like mastermind. You see Joffrey as this scary antagonist, but ultimately a child, and it's just like scary that a kid has power. But like, you're like, okay, but what the fuck is Tywin going to do? <laughs> and so like, maybe that's why they wanted to hold Ned hostage is because. You know, we have to wait till dad gets home till we decide what your punishment is. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. But it's it's really interesting. You know, yeah, this this yeah. chapter was exciting and sad. <laughs> I believe we have a break from Ned for a while now. Oh, do I we? I think we have some other chapters for a while. it's been like every while. other chapter for yeah. the last, like, I don't know, 10, 15 chapters. Because Arya's next. And then I don't know what happens after that. Yeah. But cool. Interesting. I'm interesting. excited to get Arya again. It's been a minute since we've had Arya. Right. So we'll be back next Friday with Arya. I don't know what chapter that is, but not many. It's we like four or yeah, five. She hasn't had many. many. Yeah. Excellent. And uh, on Tuesday, as I mentioned before, Tristan and I will be breaking down normal people. That was a really fun discussion. Mm. I'm very excited for you to hear that. This last Tuesday, we talked about all three Venom movies. Mm. Uh, the first one is fun. The second one is weirdly great. And the third one is not great <laughs> not good uh, at but all. it was a fun discussion we recorded it at the end of a marathon <laughs> session so that one is a little more punchy than usual and over on patreon where you can support the show for two dollars a month you can get the entire catalog of bonus episodes which is growing all the time our most recent bonus episode which was a week or two ago was the latest installment in our breakfast buffet series and in that one we talked about the borderlands movie mm. very bad uh <laughs> quiet place day one very good and what was the third one? Oh, oh, it was an Another thing that we liked. Oh, hang mm-hmm. on. It was Babadook. Babadook. That's right. what it was. We saw the Babadook yes. in theaters for the 10th anniversary. That was a really fun discussion. That was fun. And yeah. as a little preview, the next Breakfast Buffet installment that we have coming up in the next few weeks over on Patreon is the next volume of the Breakfast Buffet series. And in that one, we're talking about big, ambitious swings, kind of messes that are fascinating and <laughs> just 
huge. Kind of the hugest swings we've seen in cinemas this year. So that is Megalopolis, Joker, Folly Ado, and The Apprentice. <laughs> and yeah. I loved that discussion. That so that'll be fun. that'll be coming up in a few weeks. There's a lot of bonus content for you to catch up on and look forward to. Thank you very much for supporting the show. And we will be back here on Tuesday with another brand new episode.